Here we go. Thank you so much, Don. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, one and all for our Sunday gathering for some people watching in the maybe possibly even the room. It is actually Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And in the States here and in Canada, it's also Labor Day, the Labor Day holiday on Monday. Mm -hmm. Well, for the past two years, we have had a, a, a special event reading, mm -hmm. honoring and exploring, investigating, in a tantalizing fashion through poetry, the issues of labor. And the past two years, we've specifically featured the poets from this amazing anthology, Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace, it's edited by Carolyn Wright, Emma Lyons, and Eugenia Toledo. Um, from our friends uh, at Lost Horse Press, whom we've also featured a number of times here. The reading today is not e exclusively from the anthology. I hope we'll get to hear some poems from the anthology. I expect that we will, because today our poet's focus is, has expanded to be on the topic of labor and all of its facets. You are determining what the word means and how you're bringing it to our stage here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry for our Poets Focus special open mic today on the theme, the word, labor. Well, we have a full roster of poets raring to go already. Uh, and I am going to just make a few more remarks and get myself out of the way and start introducing our poets um, who will have um, uh, about four minutes or less. Those of you that take less time, you're creating a little bit of space to hear another bonus poem from our poets who are already on the waiting list. And, and I will aspire to get to as many folks as I can off the waiting list. Well, I'm your host, Sandy Unown for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry with incredible thanks also to Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons who help make this, this forum tick. Uh, this is our, our, our first reading of September and um, moving forward, uh, starting in this, our fall season, we're kicking off our fall season after a, a, a brief little hiatus of two weeks. So. Thanks for coming on back after our two week break. Um, we're gonna be having our poets focus readings on the first Sunday of every, um, of, every, of, of, of every month moving forward. And we'll be featuring a new book showcase in the month and then a just wild card open mic. So be plenty of opportunities for folks to read in the open mic. And we'll also get to be hearing from folks who are publishing, our members who are publishing, um, who are publishing their new books up and coming. So again, let me get myself out of the way here. Just to remind you all that it's four minutes or less uh, that will allow us to, um, that will allow us to get to folks onto the waiting list. And thank you so much, one and all, for coming to this special reading today. We've got a great audience here assembled in the Zoom room. And I know, as always, we've got folks watching out there in Facebook land on our Cultivating Voices Live Poetry page. Welcome to you as well. And of course, those of you who will be watching the recording after. Well, without further ado, let me get us right to our first poet for today. And we'll travel over to that great state here in the United States of New Mexico. And we'll begin with the illustrious editor and host extraordinaire himself, the one, the only Billy Brown. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, just a little 
picture of the cover of the third issue of our new Fiction Free Poetry Quarterly, which I just received from the printers and have sent out about 70 copies so far. Also in the chat, I put information about how you can contact me if you wish to sign up to read at a Fixed and Free reading. Uh, one has to have read a poem at Fixed and Free in order to publish in our quarterly. So without further ado, here's my Labor Day poem, Labor Day 2022. Do you know that labor unions made the following 36 things possible? Weekends without work, all of your breaks at work, including lunch breaks, paid vacation, family and medical leave, sick leave, social security, minimum wage, the Civil Rights Act prohibiting employer discrimination, eight, eight hour work week. I have to find my scroll. <laughs> Overtime pay, child labor laws, Occupation Safety and Health Act, the 40 hour work week, work workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, pensions, workplace safety standards and regulations, employer health care insurance, collective bargaining rights for employees, wrongful termination laws. I'm not going to finish the whole list. I am a proud member and leader of my faculty union, United Academics of University of New Mexico. Why did we unionize? Because of years of low wages, mistreatment and disrespect from UNM administration. Our new provost at the time wrote a letter to the editor of the student campus newspaper saying, if I had a vote, I would vote against the union. Fortunately, 90% of the contingent faculty voted for the union and 70% of the tenure stream faculty did likewise. Nevertheless, at every opportunity, the administration and particularly this provost have fought tooth and nail against everything the union has re re requested and demanded. Is it any wonder then that he wrote the letter the provost was so far out of touch with faculty on this issue. Here are three examples. The provost and the administration denied our request for equal workloads at our branch campuses where full-time faculty must teach five courses each semester compared to four courses at the main campus. Two, the provost and the administration denied our request for minimum pay for contingent faculty, even refusing to set minimum pay at the lowest pay already being paid. At some of our branch campuses, faculty are paid less than half of what faculty at the main campus are paid. Third, the administration has cheated contingent faculty out of some of their retirement benefits. I know this because I was one of them. And when I discovered this, the administration admitted they had done so and restored those several thousands of dollars of benefits to me. This same thing was done to many of my colleagues. So on this Labor Day, I am grateful for our right uh, for our faculty to unionize, even though the administration sought to deny us that right, claiming that contingent faculty are not really employees. And now the administration is fighting tooth and nail to prevent our graduate student workers from forming a union, claiming they are not employees. Most of them are being paid sub living wages. It may be high time for many faculties all over the country to take over the administration of our colleges and universities and kick the bastards out, some of whom are making over 10 times as much man money as some faculty members and fighting to keep their thumbs on the rights and livelihoods of many of their faculty. Power to the workers, throw out the bosses. Thank you. Thank you, Billy Brown. And I also will just add as a person who uh, works at a, at a college uh, that uh, this is what you're speaking is true of faculty and staff have it even, is even at least at our institutions even more egregious for staff. So I like to acknowledge that there's a number of number of folks impacted on on, on this on this front. Thank you so much, Billy. I'm going to move us along to our next poet for today. 
which is Davey Yu. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so for under the four minutes, I'll be sharing a poem that I wrote and then also a song on my uh, Alta Sax here inspired from that poem. Uh, here we go. All my talents encompass to outspin a compass, all heroic honed hobbies that soon come to pass. As such, so many I can confess, be blessed, digress. As such, I proclaim complexities to diligent digest. My gallant talents champion, colorful cosmos immense. Folding origami to give birth to bay stem and rose. Proclaim procreation from paper to elegant proper prose. Profess prof precious profoundness as each crease proposed. Ponder the wonderings on prophetic paper elements imposed. Painting styles as modern, contemporary, and abstract. Every stroke of the brush leaves much less to subtract. Effusive designs before last bell, final call, closing act. Imaginative innovations brushed with canvas ceiling packed. Improvising alto sax melodies, symphonies and maladies, monumental musical movements to mesmerize complexities. Compose expeditions from notes, staffs and visionaries, challenge Beethoven movements from auditory intricacies. As thus, these entities, intense talents and endowments, all expansive elements to emphasize a man of empowerment. I expressed diversions to therefore birth, beauty eminent. And now is the performance section of the, of the poem. <laughs> first saxophone soloist on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Oh, to, I, I can't, I can't wait for the next way. time. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, well spent four minutes. <laughs> well, next, oh, just like all, you know, I love it. Oh, Julian Magrini. Hello. Bella. Congratulations. Thank you. On your book. Thank you. The Color of Dirt was uh, released uh, September the second, so it's new. And I'll put, uh, I'll repost uh, contact information with respect to the book. But right now, uh, there is an Italian proverb that uh, Josephine Loray and I want to impart to you. And <laughs> that's right, Josephine. I'm sorry to use you. 
che semina le spine no, non può camminare a piedi nudi, which means those who sow thorns cannot walk barefoot. Now this is for my, our corporate friends, of course. These death considerations for the contented, each breath a sin against nature, a transgression against humanity, an offense against spirit, false anxieties, sham apprehensions, breath stinking and wicked through counterfeit existence. Time to go. Your presence stains and contaminates devalued real estate, intimidating every aspect of the planet with your nasty presence, your rights anathema to existence. No positivity and love have been proffered. You pollute the land further for your tax-free projects. You hire lobbyists for the purpose and misinformation is the game plan. Ensconced and perched on purple cushions, smiling and posing for the camera with your issues, your shiny shoes and teeth, a quote for the media, clamoring for your opinion. You tell us that it will not be a problem or let me check my calendar, resembling a devious digital Buddha. Suddenly, the statesman transforms to grifter Hyde, the carny man and his shill, working the crowd with his belly hoo slang, the thrill and ecstasy of the game. A calliope whines in the background, Theft and poverty are soundtracks playing immoral and whimsical notes, and no one is inspired to dance. The marks feel the shame of the long con. They live in the forever of the game, empty, sad, and without hope for themselves or their children. The carny washes his face and adjusts his proper tie. Dr. CEO must attend a business meeting, a schedule to be observed, affairs that rise above the trivial and common, misdemeanors not monitored in this category. Suddenly visions flash before me and the realization of apathy for death is clear. Today and every day is the heaven of patrician thieves. Their greed knows no waiting. Their afterlife is now. And the fear for later is for casualties of the lesser present. We walk on the thorny ground of their harvest. It comforts them and punishes us. Only we can eliminate growers of our disease. It is their nature as predators to accost and destroy. We must break their cycle of thorns and create an environment of civilization that we may walk together with exaltation. You've just been listening to Leo Magrini. Leo Magrini, thank you so much for your poem today on the issue, the theme of labor. We are here in Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's our poets focus on labor. Poets decide how they're going to present the their poem to four minutes, four minutes or less, and we get to as many folks as we can here on our live open mic. Thank you so much, and again, congratulations on your new collection. And uh, I expect we will be seeing you in a future new book showcase to feature the color of dirt. Folks feel, of course, feel free to also use the chat today respectfully to one, if you wanna post things about upcoming events that you have or your own collections or anything, those poets who are reading, if, if you wanna um, put it, something in the chat about uh, your latest collection or an upcoming reading that you're having uh, or hosting, feel free. And of course, those of you in the audience, feel free to here in the Zoom room to use um, the chat respectfully to send the love and the, uh, the love and appreciation for what you're hearing today on our Poets Focus 
on the theme of labor. Well, next we're going to hear from Ken Birch, followed by Mary Louise Kiernan. Hello. Welcome. Let me get this up here. A couple of things. These are both sort of about the two workers and to the nature of surviving work. This first one is just kind of about redefining what is and is considered work in some ways. Without you, nothing happens in this land. Whether on an assembly line, in an office, at an espresso stand or a burger joint, the places where you fuel the work of most of those who labor in other places, the daycare center where you tend the future, the classroom where you help all of us learn to be us, the night corridors where you mop, sweep, vacuum, polish, disinfect the spaces where all else occurs, the street where you march to change what is to what must be if we are to live, or where you sleep in discomfort and indignity each night, your labor, the simple task of remaining alive, of asserting as much as must be done. I am here. I deserve to be here. I am of you. All that you do is needed to keep everything else in the state of motion in which it must be kept. Thank you for what you bring to all of us. You are of us all. All of us are of you. And the second one is... Uh, more or less called laboring within walls. It's longer, but I'll try to get it. I think I can get through this. Sort of not letting work do to you what it can. Whatever you do, when you do, what you do not wish but have to do, wherever you do, what you do in the places they require you to be or stay for now, when you do, whoever you must be for now, when you do what you do for now, just to live, have to do, what they, who by chance, who by luck, who by throw of the decides, decide you must be to do what they say you owe them to do, no. No well, no without saying no to your depths, no more than you can know what they say as they watch you over the screen, over your shoulder, over your desk, under their breath is nonsense, is rubbish, is lies, is nothing. They have any right to stick upon you like a label no and no and no, you are not, you are not, you are not worthless, useless, shiftless. You are not, you are not, you are not dead wood, dead weight, dead loss. You are not, you are not, you are not expendable, dispensable, recyclable. You are not, you are not, you are not only solely, merely here just for use, here just for their use, here just until not of use. Not you, not any of you, not any or all of you. All of you, all of you, all of you, of us, all of us, all of us behind all walls, all of us kept apart from us by the walls, all of us taught to hate and fear the rest of us, each hate and fear a wall, walls millions of miles thick, walls billions of mega miles high, walls impenetrable, unsmashable, irremovable, as long, only as long as we agree that they are, as long as we agree with those who insist, who are they, even as they never were walls those who insist we live within them need us to believe are there or they who insist on them will be there no more need us to hate us or we will hate them or we will see we no longer need them we never did as we never needed pharaoh caesar king slaver emperor czar magnate robber baron manager celebrity influencer or reality star reality star we are not nothing, we are not nothing, we are not nothing, and we do not need the walls which are there only because we believe they are there, the walls confining each and all of us in who we are in this now, this now where we breathe, yet do not live, where we do, but yet never are, where we are, never who we are, yet where we are is not where we must be, yet this now is not the only now that can be. This is this now. This will not be the last now. We will reach the next now. The now that will be fully deeply now. When we make this now the then it was meant to be. When what is us? What is the ember within each of us kept glowing by the fuel of the us? Each of us, all of us have the will to be, live to be, finds the weak point. The thin bed on the cheap plywood, the spot they or we did not glue fully clothed. There's always something like that in any job where corners were cut to make one day's balance sheet. 
balance out where whether it does or not the ember will find air release the flame we kept hid till now and each flame will touch each of the others will burn away the walls that never really were and we will see each of us all of us and we will know there was no need for the walls and in that shell we will build know that know the scowls know the marks made on checkboards know the warnings issued behind doors will in the end be nothing and we will somehow some way in the end live as we were meant to thank you thank you so much you've been listening to ken birch really appreciate always hearing how you weave your words together that's a very unique voice and how you put the poems together so appreciate you being here today on our poets focus on labor and again i'm wanting to get to some to as many people as we can we've kind of we have we have enough people on the wait list now. We know we won't get any further than what we've got and if we can get through that. So I'm gonna keep moving us along folks. And next we'll be hearing from Mary Louise Kiernan followed by Josephine Loray. Welcome Mary Louise, great to have you with us today. Thank you, Sandy. So I have a, a very short poem to read about work, um, but I have a little announcement to make. Uh, it has to do with, um, poetry that I wrote and also that Don Krieger wrote. And both those, we both had work published and translated into Italian. <laughs> never, I never thought that that could ever happen. Don has had other works published in other languages. And uh, if anyone would like more information on how that happened, it is posted on my Facebook page and Instagram page. So uh, the poem I'm going to read is from my collection, The Gift of Glossophobia, and glossophobia is the fear of speaking. <clears throat> Striking poems. Work is love made visible, Khalil Shabran. She sees panhandlers with signs that read, we'll work for food and wonders do they mean to say, we'll work for love? Her ancestors forged on, struck sparks as blacksmiths, forced metal with hammers, clawed to pull out nail heads, slid strike plates to sew clothes, held stitch rippers to start over, sacrificed cells for love of other. Their granddaughter, destined to to rise up, silently writes down, scribbles in print, scripts on paper, clacks typewriter keys into letters, saves words linked to hard drives, struggles to chisel fine lines, struck by the metal and hearts of those who labored before her and watch her work at striking poems. Thank you so much, Mary Louise. I know what you mean about never having imagined, you know, a poem being translated into another language. I've had one translated into Italian myself, so I can appreciate the, the, the awe of the experience. And thank you for your contribution today to our poet's focus on the theme of labor. Well, next we go to North for me, north east to Calgary. And I am so pleased to have Josephine Lore joining us today. And Josephine will be followed by Harvey Sauce. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples that have made this territory, this land theirs for centuries Pikani, Siksika, Kainai, Nakoda and Sina. And I'm going to deviate a little bit. The, uh, the labor that I'm talking about is a different kind of labor. It's uh, coming to terms with, with death. So this, um, this summer I had a, a lovely visit with my father for about two weeks and we both knew he was at the end and I wrote a piece and then I wrote a piece after he passed away as well. So absolutely trigger warning. This is stuff that's quite raw. The first poem was um, inspired by a prompt by Robert Frost which I'll read before I read my poem. Ah, uh, 
when to the heart of man was it ever less than reason to go with the drift of things, to yield with a grace to reason, and bow and accept the end of a love or a season. And my poem's called To Sit Quietly. Ah, such treason to sit quietly with death, to not shake his cold grip from my arm, to know he waits expectant in the hall, my father's ragged exhalation tainted by his breath. My father's face grown gaunt, teeth missing from his skull, fingers spectral, and sometimes his gaze dimmed as if he sees us only from afar, a figment of himself wavering between this realm and next, like summer bed bedsheets flapping in the wind. Photographs bring heaves and tears as he recalls the young man he once was. He moans in his sleep and he talks in his dreams. Emaciated legs no longer hold his withered frame. He winces when I tend his wounds, but brightens when he says my name. And I think death must mean no great harm. For 90 is a long time on this earth. So I no longer resent the tender touch of that which I no longer dread. But oh, what anguish to sit quietly with death and not shake his cold grip from my arm. The second poem, I'd gone into one of my writing circles. Thanks for your comments, everybody. Um, and poetry is a way for me to process and to heal and to kind of make sense of things. And the assignment for the free write was to think of a time of day. And I chose after lunch, you know, 1.30 or 2. But somebody else got my time and I was given 9.30. And because of being in Toronto, it was actually 9.30 when I was writing. So this is the autobiography that I wrote that night. It's called 9.30. It is 9.30. My body says sleep. My mind says rest. My heart steps out into the night, leaving the door wide open in search of the call of coyotes. If I had a slingshot and seven smooth stones, five smooth stones, even three, I would pluck the street lights from the sky one by one, so all that would be left would be the cold moon and me. I no longer care about the stars. Their stories no longer matter. The chatter of man, the warmth of fire in fields, none of it. There is a place in my father's garden, a bower of fig. And when I stood in it, sunlight filtered through various spots as if our sky held multiple suns. That was the day after my father died. It is 9.34. I looked at the clock and noticed when 24 hours had slipped by after his death. He passed at 0, 0, 18. Time has become an accordion with only sad strains stretching out and tumbling past. It has been six days since he passed, 30 hours since his cold body was jacklifted into a maw sealed with putty and trowel and drill. My father had a trowel just like that. He too used tools. I had gone down to the garage into one of those balsa wood baskets that once held summer tomatoes, tucked one of my father's tools into my tote for the funeral home in case I needed to feel him a wrench, and I tucked a few nails into the pocket of his best suit and some loose change. He always had nails in his pocket when he worked, a carpenter, like the father of Christ. Nails and coins sometimes fell out of his pockets when he lay down to nap. And when I vacuumed the couch cushions, I would find them, quarters and nickels and pennies and dimes. And always a pencil behind his ear, a smile on his face as brilliant as the Sicilian sky. It is now 9.38. I felt his spirit surround me while his lungs still expanded and emptied and his pacemaker heart still beat. His hands still warm. That was before his forehead felt like he had just been taken out of deep freeze. 
when I brought my lips to his brow in the casket. I cupped his head with both hands. He didn't like to be called. He would ask, cover me, please. He asked so little of me at the end. His spirit around me this past four that afternoon, my kids coming in from their day long travel, me at the entrance of the hospital breathing real air for the first time in days. I felt him and I felt his peace. And if I sit quiet for a moment, I can still feel it. But will it fade like the taste of salt in the sea, the aroma of coffee, a hug that feels like it could go on forever if only? If only we could stand still enough. I do not know. It is 9.42. Thank you very much. Oh my God. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josephine. And of, of course, we uh, Kim made such a poignant comment that, you know, grief is incredibly incredibly hard work and um i appreciate you bringing this this new work to bring it to our consciousness today here and of course my heart goes out to you and your family so thank you uh, i'm gonna move us along my friends keep breathing keep breathing keep breathing and we'll move next to Harvey Sauce, and then Harvey will be followed by okay. Cathal of Frankfurt. Can you hear me? You're good. Okay, fine. Uh, some notes on the two-part poem I'm going to read, which uh, relates to uh, a time when we labored across country in covered wagons. Uh, the Eddie and Foster families referred to were among those trapped with the Donner Party in the Sierra Nevada mountains in 1846 to 1847, most of whom didn't survive. Forlorn hope is a term uh, referring to a largely fatal attempt to escape Donner Pass. And Chief Truckee of the Paiutes was known to be friendly to settlers seeking passage to California or Oregon. A lake named after him was renamed Donner Lake after the loss of the Donner Expedition. Now, let me find the poem. This is called Incidents and Accidents in Pursuit of a Manifest Destiny. One, last surviving member of the Donner Party. Mostly I missed dessert. We ate them, we ate them all. Funny the manner in which I learned to clean my plate. I was only a child, remember. At that age, I should have been feeding on mother's milk, not on mother and brother, on Eddie or foster kids at Truckee, now renamed Donner Lake. Certainly, they didn't smack of chicken, as some have claimed, sinewy and hard as the frozen ground they died on snowed in. After the ox hide was gone, we chewed on skin. We children sucking ourselves to sleep on pinky fingers that passed for pacifiers. After this experience, I would not kiss the ring finger of the Queen of England as too much reminding me of those months at Donner Pass. Later at Sutter's Fort Bear Valley, rescuers would sometimes joke that females went down easier, softer, less chewy. I myself was too young to make such comparisons, unable to distinguish malnourished breast flesh from patriarchal tongue. Forlorn hope snowshoe party survivors, perhaps having developed a taste for it, have told me that we were pushed to our limits, scarfing down the hide roofs over our heads, boiling saddle leather before we made salvatory soup meat of our dead. I cannot confirm or deny. Hope apparently having proved too thin a gruel for sustenance, too many having given an arm and yes, a leg, so others wouldn't die. Two, let her home on taking leave of a preborn child. 
You'll be sorry to hear that we were too cash poor for even a pine coffin. We had to bury the miscarriage of our Lucy named after you in a shoebox. A meteor shower over South Pass lasted longer than she did. What a heartbreaker she would have been with her mother's eyes, a real charmer for death to flaunt on its lucky charm bracelet, unluckily for us. Our medicine show of love boasting no balm of Gilead to save her. Only a bit of a thing really, not taking up much space in the grave we clawed with bruised fingers out of the continental divide, a hole less deep than a prairie dog's burrow, planting crossed twigs on top, a headboard torn from an abandoned wagon, declaring its occupant, baby girl Lucy, born dead, giving pause to those less friendly than Chief Truckee was, northern Paiutes hidden in the trees, whose presence panicky mules can sense. The mule tears fearing to encounter faces painted with bad intentions were only willing to chalk the wagons a short time for our child's interment for a few words hurriedly ginned up between tears before insisting we move on. Some say the Pacific, accounted a bastard son of Job's Leviathan, can swallow Kentucky whole with room left over for Tennessee. I think we have already lost too much. Unforewarned by God or man that our westward journey might impose such a toll. Thank you. What a poem. What a poem. I was saying in that I was saying in the chat there there really should be an anthology about poems about the Donner Party. Uh, incredible. Thank you so much. And it should be called All You Can Eat Diner. No. <laughs> okay. Uh it's some it's an amazing story and uh I hope those who might not be familiar with it will be inspired by having heard Harvey Suss read about uh, the experiences of the Donner Party. Well, we move from New York across the pond, as I like to say, and we'll get to hear from our good friend, Cathal McFrienford. Hello, hello all, hello Sandy. I hope you can hear me okay. I can hear you perfectly, you sound great. <laughs> As usual, I keep the video off uh, for the just for the audio. Okay, a poem for you on labor. It's called The Labor Pain. A winter's night's cloth on the windowsill, grandfather start, washing upon the line, hardened by the freezing night's frosted fall. The workday start frozen within a time where a molten tar would not flow on a road. As men Cup cold hands near the burning coals of a brazier hissing against the cold, coughing as spitting ash about them reels. Grateful drag on a player's navy cut, kettle steaming for the first mug of tea. The angled jaunt of his fedora hat, a ganger, captain on a tarring sea. His weather eye foresees new tarred road, stretching out before him to a new day, bright, sparkling, fresh. They're for the great and good, a path too for labor to earn its pay. So when you next remember Labor Day, or muse upon that first Monday in May, remember with respect all those who rise each morning with the sleepy yawn of day to make the paths we tread softer in life, that we may easier see each day down. That's it. Thank you, Sandy. Back to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cathal, and uh, a good reminder that we also in the we also in the past have also focused um, on uh, issues around labor on May Day here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, and today it's our poets' focus on labor during as we uh, here in the United States and in Canada um, have Labor Day on tomorrow Monday. Um, but the, the issue of labor is one of every single day, isn't it, folks? So uh, it's, a, it's a very prismatic, prismatic theme. Well, I will move us along as I aspire to get us to as many people as we can when we get to the open mic 
um, the to the waiting list on our open mic. Next, uh, we get to hear from David Bridges, and that and David will be followed by Charlotte Hart. Welcome, David. Thank you, Sandy. Um, this is probably the most um, um, at home open mic and uh, somewhat comfortable. I know some of these poems have not been comfortable, but that's that's fine. Um, <clears throat> I'm a 20 year uh, construction and general workers uh, local 92 member, um, Edmonton, Alberta. I'm also a member of LUNA, the Laborers International Union of North America. So I have a little bit of experience about working in dirty, dangerous, and drudgery jobs, and also fighting for uh, safety rights for uh, the workers. In fact, um, I lost my job one time because I spoke up. Uh, there was a, a safety incident. We had a, um, a meeting. There were 250 workers and uh, the corporate safety people did their PowerPoint presentation. They had the arrogance not to even leave a microphone in that room. But I was at the back and I was ready and I pummeled them with questions and they were very squeamish and uncomfortable. After the meeting, uh, my fellow workers shook my hand and said, well, it was nice to know you, Dave. And a week later, I was laid off due to a shortage of work. We were in the middle of the construction project. There was no shortage of work, but um, you know, um, I have my principles and I um, am proud to fight for the workers when others are terrified to speak up because they're afraid of losing their job. It's just a job. Um, so, and I go to bed um, with a clean conscience and hit that pillow knowing that I did my best. <clears throat> um, I was at the Sun, um, I was on night shift and I was at the Suncor refinery uh, coker complex and I was in an elevator and it broke down. And I was with um, another uh, worker and he was an ex coal miner. And we were there for several hours. So he started telling me stories and stories. And one of these stories I um, put into this poem. Um, a trigger warning. Um, this poem has uh, rough violence content. The designated hitter. Johnny never played baseball, but he could hit. The men of the deep called him the hitter. It's a tough, dangerous life down below, stuck all day in a noisy rock tunnel coffin. Desperation leads some coal miners to leave fast. That's when Johnny's shovel bat worked. Johnny had the aim and eye of a samurai warrior. His job is to strike clean and quick. Brutal, but the men are already broken. What's a cracked bone to a deeply fractured soul? The angels of lighter pain work overtime to aid some fallen men in the dark. Today, it's Jimmy's turn to break away. Johnny takes his stance in the hitter's box, puts a block of wood in Jimmy's mouth, hits his shoulder blade with a whack. Jimmy yells, hit me harder. His back is muscled and solid like the rock he blasts and breaks. Johnny swings a harder blow as Jimmy's shoulder cracks. His body rocks, chokes, on a gulped scream. Johnny's hit a major home run for the miner with a slumped shoulder. Jimmy can run home to his pregnant wife and stop running a little while for his life. Spitting out the wood, he staggers to the elevator cage, a freer man. He's earned a six month pain vacation. Jimmy rehearses his official story of the falling rocks, 
in a loyalty locker all workers share. But Johnny misses hitting the phantom monkey on his back, the one with the bloody question mark, deeply cut into the bones of men's being. Thank you so much. It's David Bridges, powerful poem, powerful poem. Um, and, and thank you for sharing your story of speaking out in support of your fellow workers and your own rights. Um, I too am a member of a, of a union as well and I very much value them. Um, thank you. Well, next we go to Charlotte Hart and Charlotte will be followed by Shanet Carraza. Work, labor, they're on freeways, unfree in their cars, they migrate in a time-sensitive commute to jobs. The train's Doppler and the travelers go in a daze each day to offices and factories. Buses open and close their hungry metal mouths, consuming and releasing the passengers as they travel to earn. In the air, flying through the clouds, Meetings are planned, deals drawn up, the market checked. What is work but the effort to support a need or a dream for self or others? Workers in tall buildings have plans. Hire, fire, resign, quit. Members in union halls, strike signs, for sale signs, weary shopkeepers in sprawling malls, teams in stadiums, desk clerks, housekeepers in halls, waitresses, chefs, programmers, teachers, workers wearing orange vests, an actress learning lines, a pianist practicing a piece for the 500th time, lawnmower crews, reporters reading news, the efforts are their work, their lives. Sometimes labor is inspiration and art, but work is for the most part a yoke of money and the need to spend. But look, in this room, the lovers are breathing quick breaths together. He's holding her hand. She is dilated and in a labor of love. She pushes and emits a sound so profound it must have come from another place outside of time and space. Another push, a press in distress. This is labor beyond commerce, a moan, transcendent moment, present presence of the unknown. Curled in her womb, time stands still as the future kicks. Eternal passage, ocean of desire, tactile fire of submission, labor sublime. She is pushing her love into freedom, into light, a unique soul, stressing for blessing, coming now, a dream to earth, a breath, a scream, birth. Oh, we have conquered death. We have given our truth a future beyond us with a name, consciousness, and a life, our joy. The lovers and their boy begin new work that they know as grace. They will labor to serve and deserve this holy favor. Oh, thank you so much, Charlotte. I, I so appreciate how you integrated, you know, the, the, the many aspects of labor within the one poem. Astounding. Thank you so much for your contribution today. 
We are here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry for our Sunday reading. It's our poet's focus on labor. And uh, I, I hope that everyone will go watch the video who wasn't here live today. The poems are just astounding today. Thank you, one and all. I move us along to our next reader for today, Ashana Kaoraza, and followed by Jennifer Elise Wang. Welcome. I'm so glad you're with us today. Thank you. Uh, so I'm from the anthology on this, uh, belonging to the section of arts and sciences, my poem, Macuil Sochinsin. Macuil Sochinsin, celebro tu poesía. Tú eres una guerrera águila, de entre la oscuridad sales, de entre la historia perdida emerges. Anontegua non cuica, elevo mis cantos. Frase que vive por siempre, Macuil Sochinsin. Hasta ya que tú celebras, mujer poeta que registra las crónicas de guerra. Inon topegua, axayacat non iwa. Por todas partes, axayacat hizo conquistas. Recuerdas en tu poesía las mujeres que salvaron a Tlitatl, quien hirió a axayacat. Macuilsochinsin, tienes flores en tu sangre, tus cantos, tu poesía. In Xochitl, in Cuicatl, son recordados por siempre. A los 41 años compusiste palabras eternas. Por toda la tierra tus cantos dejan huella. La poesía te reclama, Macuil Xochinsin. Tu noble formación se refleja en tus versos. Mujer de palabras de Jade. Macuil Xochinsin, poeta con sangre de obsidiana. Que comiencen los cantos, que comience la danza. In cuicatl, in imacotecatl. Macuilsochinsin, I celebrate your poetry. You are an eagle warrior. From obscurity you come out of lost history. Anompegua non cuica, I lift up your chant. That phrase lives forever, Macuilsochinsin. You celebrate at Sajakatu. You are the women poet who records chronicles of war. Ino te pegua, Aksajakatu non iwatu. Aksajakatu conquered all places. In your poetry, you remember the women who saved Klilatu, the man who wounded at Sajakatu. Makwilsochinsin, you have flowers in your blood, your chant, your poetry. In Xochitl, in Huicatl, are remembered forever. At 41 years of age, you compose eternal words. All over the earth, your chants leave their mark. Poetry claims you, Macuil Xochinsin. Your nobility is reflected in your stanzas, woman of jade words. Macuil Xochinsin, poet with obsidian blood, let the chant begin. Let the dance start in in cuicatl, in mayon de coquilo. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Shanat Caraza. Uh, also, thank you so much. I, I always appreciate when we are able to hear poems in their home language and in translation. Uh, what a fabulous contribution and the anthology that she was referring to, which I cannot, I cannot endorse enough, I cannot encourage you to purchase enough, is Raising Lily Ledbetter. Women poets occupy the workspace. Edited by Carolyn Wright, ML Lyons, and Titania. Thank you again. Muchas gracias. It's so hard with the open mic because you know me, folks. I want to continue to sing praises and talk about the poems, but I, I do need to get, I do need to move us along. And so next we'll get to hear from Jennifer Elise Wang, followed by Laura Ruth Loomis. Welcome, Jennifer. I'm so glad you're with us today. Uh, yeah, I am. Um... 
really in love with this theme and super passionate with what I have to share. Um, so I do burlesque and pole dance for fun, but it's also has its origins in sex work. And so uh, I am a huge sex work ally <laughs> or my pole dancing cat <laughs> shirt for this. But uh, this poem I wrote is um, about the stripper strike that is going on in North Hollywood for better conditions. Um, and I kind of want to add an addendum because recently I learned that uh, the strike itself uh, was sort of built upon the labor of black women and trans women who aren't represented. And so I'm gonna post some links of some of the other strikes going on because uh, their work needs to be recognized. And that's why like the sex worker movement is so uh, powerful is because it is it provides opportunities for uh, marginalized individuals. But so my poem is called Being Roommates with a Stripper. When your roommate is a stripper, you discover who makes the teeniest thong you can legally get away with, and that seven inch pleasers aren't too bad to walk in. When your roommate is a stripper, you start going to the gym more, not to have her body exactly, but to have the same gluteal control in order to twerk along with her in your at-home dance parties. When your roommate is a stripper, you see the stacks of ones, but not the fives, tens, or twenties she has given to the house and staff. When your roommate is a stripper, you stop laughing at jokes about her job because her colleague was stalked and another was threatened while the bartender laughed at the image of her possible demise. Every night, it's a flip of the coin as to whether she'll be assaulted. When your roommate is a stripper, you learn about misogynoir, turfs and swerfs, labor rights and union busting tactics, and that it's always sex worker and never prostitute or the other word that sounds more apropos for fishing. When your roommate is a stripper, you get advice on how to set boundaries while still smiling at the customer. When your roommate is a stripper and getting ready for a night of picketing, while you've come home after overtime and drink a beer with some Tylenol for your carpal tunnel and plantar fasciitis and blink away your dry eyes, you realize you are selling your body too. Jennifer Lee Swang, thank you so much for for bringing these issues to our program today. Folks, look for uh, what Jennifer will be putting in the chat. Um, again, we're, we're focusing on the theme of labor and, um, and you know, who labors and, and all different aspects of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that we had a poem um, about sex workers today on the program. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And we will next hear from Laura Ruth Loomis, followed by Don Krieger, before we head to the waiting list where we'll get in as many folks as we can. Thank you. Hi, um, I am an anti-social social worker, and this is from Workers Rights, Tales from the Couch edition. It's called Protection. The social worker on TV has a pinched face, glasses on a chain, a harsh gray suit with a choking collar, gray hair in a bun so tight it's cutting off the circulation to her brain. She has a degree and no children. She doesn't have a first name. She's probably never been 30 minutes in the same room with an actual child. She calls her clients those people. She has appeared on your doorstep because you're temporarily on welfare and she's heard you have a dirty house. Her white glove inspection comes up clean until she spies a stuffed animal out of place. Instantly, she rips the baby from your arms and drags off the five-year-old who's yelling, mommy, don't leave me. She hands you a six foot stack of books with titles like principles of appropriate parenting and tells you if you can read your way to the top, you'll get your kids back. She hurls your children into the car and you never see them again. The social worker on the other channel eats a lot of donuts. He comes to your house when the screams get too loud for the neighbors to ignore. You know him by first name because the neighbors have called him 47 times before. He calls children cases. You offer to show him the welts on your back, but he has four seconds between you and his next case and he hasn't forgiven you for interrupting his paperwork. He tells your dad not to do it again. Your dad calls your two-year-old sister a bitch and she jumps because she thinks that's her name. 
I walk a line so narrow it casts no shadow. I'm the surgeon who decides when a family is so diseased we have to amputate a limb. I wear a mask of frost and thaw out the tears when I get home. You won't find my face on any channel. I don't have children. I do too much paperwork. I don't call anyone those people. I've caught myself calling children cases and it's always a sign I have too many. Kids do call me by first name. Some of them hug me, some of them braid my hair. My house is dirtier than yours. Once I did take a baby from his mother's arms. Her scream banged my head like a lead pipe, but that baby will have a second birthday. In the land of ice, an igloo seems a strange refuge built to the same cold stuff that's all around, but it keeps out the freezing wind. For some children, I'm all the shelter there is. And uh, very quickly, I'm gonna add one from Raising Lily Ledbetter. Awesome book, everyone get it. Um, you can tell this is a very old poem because it makes reference to a beeper. So uh, any youngsters here, that's how you got hold of someone in an emergency before there were cell phones. Social work of like, I write reports while talking on the phone about a different case. This evening, I'm about to take my files and notebook home. A mother wants to talk. I don't have time. I mix up names. Now they're all named caseload. Home visits every month? Girl, that's a joke. Just tell the kids to line up by the road and wave as I drive by, pretend we spoke. My car, my office, which place do I live? A lawyer wails, she doesn't have a beeper. Between the foster parents, relatives, parents and kids, I'm everybody's keeper. Biology is what finally protects us. Thank heaven I was not born ambidextrous. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Laura Ruth Loomis. Tales from the Couch is the book, but of course we got to hear one of the poems in Raising Lily Ledbetter. It's page 162, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. And now for our final uh, feature in the official open mic, we turn to Don Krieger. Thank you, Don. Always happy to have a poem from you in the program. Thanks, Sandy. And thanks, Laura. That, those are powerhouse poems and kind of companions to mine. Uh, these poems appeared in professional journals, one in the American Journal of Nur Nursing and the other one in Neurology. Sunday morning surgery. Radiation had saved her left her neck atrophied, skin like paper, withered carotid, now near closed, downstream clot pulsing, poised to kill. The breathing tube is wrong. Their voices burst out, panicked. That fragile skin and vessel, bulging white, scope blade hooking down her throat. I called to the surgeon, Get in here before they kill your patient. He pushes them aside, removes, then replaces the tube. Her signs turn lifeward. Another skirmish won. Small victory. Battle fatigue. The surgeon carves, dissects, sears the bleeding. The anesthetist, numbness, paralysis, stupor. My part to hear and report each limb's electric murmurs, the brain's muffled replies mixed with the wine of machines, arrogance, fear. We fight for normal life on waking. We trust normal will return for us. They are out there, our charges, 10,000 who woke well, those who did not. I don't recall their faces, just the smell of blood and burning. 
the urgent charge, uphold life. Sick wonder when the lamp goes dark. Why did I have to see that? Thank you so much, Don Krieger. Don, actually, you have a lot of poems that connect to this theme, which, and I appreciate them very, very much. Everybody, we are moving now to the waiting list and I'm gonna extend the reading a little bit. Let's get through it. Let's get through everybody. Um, we'll stay to, I'll stay, we'll stay to the half hour if that's okay, everybody. And if you can't stay to the half hour, it's only 15 minutes longer than we had anticipated. That will get us to everybody on the reading list. Uh, hopefully it's one poem um, and we'll start with Carolyn Wright. Well, thanks so much, Sandy and <clears throat> Kim and Dawn and everybody here who's been reading uh, powerful work. <clears throat> I'm gonna read one poem from the anthology, not, not one of mine, but this is <clears throat> Leslie Newman's poem, which is on page 110. This is my favorite to sort of lighten the mood a little bit, but also, <laughs> uh, you'll see, it's called Adjustment One, Shifting Piles. I place a pile of credits to my left and a pile of debits to my right. After I type the numbers from the debits onto the credits, I pile the debits on top of the credits. Then I pull the carbons from the credits and separate the copies into piles. I interfile the piles and bring them over to the files where I file the piles and pull the files, making a new file of piles. Then I make files for the pile that had no files and put them into a new file pile. I take the new file pile down the aisle over to the table where Mabel makes labels for April to staple. I take the new labeled staple file pile back down the aisle over to the file to be interfiled with the pile of filed files. After I file April's piles, I get new debits from Debbie and new credits from Carrie. I carry Carrie's and Debbie's debits back to my desk and place a pile of credits to my left and a pile of debits to my right. After I type the numbers from the debits onto the credits, it's 10 o'clock and we have exactly 15 minutes to go down to the cafeteria and drink coffee or go out into the parking lot and scream. <laughs> One of the best descriptions of the minutia of work circa 1974 that I've ever heard of. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And uh, we should both reach out to Leslie and let her know that you read the poem today on the program. We'll do. She'll appreciate we'll do. it. Let's we'll do. do that. <laughs> Thank you. The poem is from Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Occupy, Women Poets Occupy, the workspace from our editor. All right. Co-editor, I should say. Thank you. All right, we, I'm moving us along on the waiting list so we can get everyone in. Uh, and we'll next hear from Lenora Good, followed by Susan Young. Good afternoon. Um, mine is not a labor poem per exactly, but I figure anyone who has gone through COVID has definitely labored. There you go, there you go. Yep, that's day, right. Day 6,486 of COVID-19 lockdown. All young men in my city now earn money delivering groceries to us old farts and fartesses. There are 2,369 ways to prepare cabbage to eat. I'm still working on how many ways to cook an egg. Vodka on Fruit Loops ain't half bad, but Irish cream on Cocoa Puffs is better. Have given up on wine. 
too afraid that grape stompers have COVID feet. Or is that cloven feet? Bread now must be home baked. Yeast is found only flying loose in the air. I love sourdough, but I can't eat bread. I buy whatever groceries the store has. Necessity may be the mother of invention. Hunger makes for very strange stir fries. My neighbors dress up to take their garbage to the dumpster. I'm still in my jammies at bedtime, but I do put on shoes. The batteries in my bathroom scale have died. Does it matter? Thank you so much, Lenora, for your You're contribution welcome. today. And we will move next to Susan Young, followed by Max Vandersteen. Welcome, Susan. I'm glad you're with us today. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, it's kind of hard for me. Well, I've been writing about work anyway, but um, um, this is, a, I guess, a short synopsis of prose about my work I've done in the past. Um, and uh, in the background is an abstract painting I call Kimono but that's for later. All due respect, I have worked in the fields of Oregon picking strawberries, raspberries, wax, yellow, and green beans. At the age of eight, I got my social security number before anybody in my peer group. Two, many years later in 1984, I went to the Philippines for an Oxfam study tour to Cebu, an island, where I turned a corner and quickly photographed this photo. It is a young, probably five-year-old girl weaving baskets to be sold in New York City's Bloomingdale's. I thought she ever got paid minimum wages. Three. As for myself, I had worked as a freelance typesetter for 25 years until everyone had computers and could do their own simplified graphic layouts. I would get jobs three times a week and the rest of the week work on my paintings. I rarely had a social life. I mean, working freelance is like 11 to 6, 3 to 2 a.m., 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. However, the pay was more than a pay stub mechanical would make. With most of the money made, I managed to save and travel to third world nations to photograph the money, uh, photograph how local people work and survive under worse working conditions. Unfortunately, Americans are not interested unless we are invading their territories. After working as a full-time employee at the American Museum of Natural History, I encountered the glass ceiling. I worked there for eight years until I mentioned save the children for a misjudgment by the authorities or administrators. I got booted out for being a whistleblower I used my vacation time to attend a woman's Buddhist conference in Leh, Ladakh, North India. There I saw many women working hard as an agrarian feudal culture according to Buddhist text. Especially if she wanted to be spiritually educated, she would have to work in the field 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then in a poorly misshaped nunnery to learn Buddhism text, reading and writing until midnight. And the cycle continues in North India. One of my last jobs was working for the Brooklyn Daily Ego that has a long historic background. I felt honored to be in the journalistic environment. However, due to sexual harassment, I could not continue there if men are constantly lifting and unzipping their zippers in front of me. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Susan. And, you know, what a great prompt for, you know, for what you've modeled for us that, you know, that, 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 that we could all use the lens of the different jobs we've held to talk about the issues connected to um, labor and labor rights. I really appreciate how you structured the poem through the, the work that you've done. And yeah, I would encourage folks to, you know, follow suit. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great prompt that you've modeled for us today. Again, thank you very, very much. I so appreciate you being with us and taking us on that journey. Thank you. Well, Max Vanderstein has shared poems about uh, labor with us before on the program. And I'm really glad that, that Max, you're able to be with us once again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. I really appreciate that you added on the uh, waiting list and I do get an opportunity to share once again. Uh, it's kind of difficult for me to choose a poem actually, as you said, I've written so many. Um, some of which are in this book, which I read from on the new book showcase here on this platform. Like David, I'm a, um, a worker who's worked on many industrial plant sites as a member, a retired member of the Plumbers and Pipefitters. So I've written many poems about the work sites and the labor parabola, but um, this one is a rather recent one I wrote and it's called Laws of Work. Work can be defined as the act of engagement in a mental or physical activity in order to gain results or earn a living out of these processes of productivity. Construction, operation, and the maintenance of petrochemical plants and installations establishes arenas for hordes of workers to perform various vital occupations. The hours of work are arduous and burdensome for days upon days upon backs of employed men whose skills are used sacrificially in a slick oil field battleground for financial dominion. Drudging and unsung, the forces of labor like cogs in the gears grind on, grind on in endless vocation working countless forced ships that wear many men down to propel processes of the corporation. Abrasion, exposure, fatigue, and maltreatment are symptoms of an antagonistic system displayed when mechanism or methodology consists of misuse, considered to be custom. Any neglect and disrespect for maintenance of crucial components within those plant processes in time leads to breakdown or inefficiency, which introduce systems to unneeded distress. Disregard and arrogance wear on the masses, but in accordance with Ohm's law of resistance, the longer is the circuit of servility, greater grow calls for equalities in systems. Part two, work can be defined as the exertion of force required to overcome existing resistance or measure of energy transfer that occurs when moving any object over a distance. The application of pressure is transmitted in equal magnitude as Pascal's law asserts to each and every point within a closed system in all directions based on how much one exerts. According to these hypotheses, it's assumed pressure increases when the volume is compressed. Correspondingly, the resistance increases when masses are systematically oppressed. Two pistons, which are variably advancing, double the impact on the absolute pressure, where one will register internal surface force and gauged by Boyle's law, it is easy to measure. But there are no dials to calibrate the leverage exerted to manipulate repercussion or the levels of despair and disenchantment produced through operational corruption. The only indications are in the numbers, reading out percentages and capacities of optimal production and profit margins versus duration of life and casualties. 
terms often used in financial references to the length of useful serviceability of equipment components and materials, and also forecast workforce manageability. Recognizing that there can be no reliance in principles like the law of averages, realize Newton's laws of motion call for equal and opposite reactions against such ravages. Point three, work can be defined as the act of bringing things to desired condition or consistency by squeezing, kneading, or any other technique that uses actions of persuasive persistency. History has hammered the factions of light labor through perpetuation of acts unsavory and a division consistently reinforced beginning with the inception of slavery. Incessantly beaten by statutes and standards, were besieged by a recurrent cruel regimen of hunger and poverty used effectively as coercive powers which impel ranks of men to comply with detrimental work conditions and the consequential malformed identities created by imbalanced manipulations simply to survive and support their families. If the gap is never bridged, divergence widens. It shifts. If shifts never cease, the cycle keeps spinning. When balance is obstructed, the system wobbles, and when fairness is withheld, there is no winning. At what point do we dare to gauge the social slide that has resulted in such an unjust divide? It takes no laws of science to believe in truth. Just take instead the 1% as ample proof. Thank you. Yeah, the one percent. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much, Max. Max Vanderstein joining us from Canada today. And um we move now to I believe Isaac Cohen is with us still on the program, followed by Linda. E. Crawford. Yes. Hi, Isaac. Yes, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Don, all my friends in the world. I the coin, the grain of sand. Yes, two brothers were walking barefoot in the streets of Dardar city. The throne created a sand storm. One grain of sand entered a woman's eyes. Another woman came to help her. The woman sight returned. They saw the two brothers and they uh, decided to buy shoes for them. They bought Two, two pairs of shoes and socks. They gave some money to their mother. A single parent who raises her children alone. They send her to a career development center. The mother finish the program with distinction. He opened a cosmetic clinic at the opening party of the cleaning the throne sent bright lights 
and an uh, aura appeared on the each of the charitable woman. The mother set aside a church of her profit for buying shoes for poor children. God was happy and blessed the city of Dardar with a lot of money. Thank you, Isaac and Israel. Thank That's you. Isaac. It's Isaac Cohen. Always, yes. <laughs> always love having Isaac Cohen joining us tonight from Israel. Thank you, Isaac. Yes, we will move you. next to, we've just got a few more readers to go on our wait list. And we're going to get everyone in. And our next reader is Linda E. Crawford. Linda, so good to see you today. I know, likewise. You know, I come and stay behind camera always. But I know I you do. Felt, <laughs> I felt compelled to at least try to, to read this time. This is such a wonderful space. So thank you so much. And just a brief note uh, regarding the poem I'm going to read. It's really speaking about the issue of how, women working within the home, how that's dismissed as women's work and not valued. And I'm coming to it through the game of jacks, which is dismissed as a girl's game. Uh, you will hear me say fat pork. I do need to let you folks know that that is the colloquial name of a fruit in Barbados. It has nothing to do with meat or weight. So um, let me uh, begin. Dexterity. Hear it, a scraping of knuckles as your hand grabs the right amount of metal spikes, edges soft and round to protect innocence. Sixes and sevensies, can you see your swiftness, the sweep and swoosh to take in all life has to give before your tiny, bouncing ball drops. Your skill as you shift joy to your weak side, free your public palm, grab a descending star in a moment of risk. Can you catch that falling sun? Sixes and sevenses, see how you buy dexterity with less tried aims, your imbalance of grip, Dust covering your fingers, knees scrunched, toes bent. Just enough vernix on your skin to glory in play and sound. You were yearning for the new world's promise. No heavy water pail at the standpipe, pad on head, stiff spine, limber neck. No miles to walk for loaves of bread. Only your breath fresh in power, lock in fist. Did you know a day was entering? Draw string in a bag and plastic, your jack's game tamed, frisk gone, your joy snatched. Old jacks in tin cans capture breadfruit and fish cakes, fat pork and period blood of puberty, swooping in laughter, reveling in rub of prize against palm, youth gripped in glee. But come eventide, a new dexterity will settle in, find you scraping, always a braiding, woman cutting and contriving. Thank you. Wow, what a poem, what a poem. I appreciate it, thank you. Linda Crawford, I actually have a set of jacks and I used to play. So um, I it's a vintage set and I've got another set that are sitting in a tin can. That's amazing. 
Thank you so much for the poem. Always today. undervalued. Thank you so much. Always unbelievable. Wow. All right. We'll have to talk, Jax. It's another time. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, and I can't wait for the next reading. I'm so glad you're here today to read. Well, next is Phyllis Klein, and we will close out with Indran Amir the Nayagam. Great to have you here, Phyllis, today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I really enjoyed this so much today. Thanks, everyone, for the amazing poetry. And I put something in the chat, just I'm looking for a tech person to help me with my reading. It's called Poets in Conversation. It's on Zoom. And if anybody, Sandy or anyone else, um, has any ideas for me, um, I'd be really, really really appreciate that thank you um so i'll try to read this quickly i realize i've been here a long time but i couldn't help but think of reading this today it's called cultivation i'll just say i'm in california cultivation the yellow lacy edged squash green beans sweet peas broccolini arugula, baby, red leaf, lettuce, all organic, each one of these in my vegetable box, in my frying pan, on the table, fruits of the dirt picked from their plants, children weaned from mother's wombs, the fields at midnight when laborers arrive, knives, gloves, baseball caps, half asleep from the journey to cross the border, or follow the harvest as the bushes prepare their offspring in ripening. Everything so fragile, so transient, the fields already almost ready to be stripped again, plowed into submission another growing season. The workers bent at the back to meet their livelihood, to feed the people, and now not only the jeopardy of deportation, also the infected air, the hidden danger in their fellow workers' breath, and the heat as if the food was meant to cook right on its vine. The ease of spoilage. Does the harvester begin to hate the beautiful, the perfect progeny, the sensuous cabbage, the proud okra? Could he never bear to eat again another translucent lettuce leaf, another holy stalk of kale? The grind of muscle stretched over vertebrae for a wage low enough to keep him worried, exhausted. The boxes brought to my door, perfectly fact, packed, no toxic smoke, no taste of regret or disappointment on their sturdy vegetable bodies, rejoicing in the glow of existence newly delivered. Let no one be hungry. Let me bow to the backs that bent at the hip to reach the carrots, the hands that held the knives to cut broccoli, the hearts that persevered next to the beat of the harvester machines, the rhythms of feeding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And I, I'll def, I'll be reaching out to you to just Thank check in with you. Of okay, course. Great. And uh, folks, we are at our final reader. But before before we hear from Indran, I just want to remind you all we've been listening today to poems on our poets focus on labor, and Phyllis had a line in her poem. Let no one be hungry. A couple months, our theme is going to be hunger. So in no November, our poet's focus will be on hunger. So be thinking about those poems then. Uh, your, po your poem reminded me of that. Thank you. Well, it's always good to see um, this international host and editor extraordinaire and human extraordinaire, poet extraordinaire, Indran Amirthanayagam. I'm so thrilled to see you, my friend, and um, thank, you. thank you for being with us. And I can't wait to hear your poem. Thank you so much, Sandy. You know, thank you all. And, and you know, in November, let's get out the vote. Let's get out the vote. 
against hunger, against homelessness, against war, against suffering, uh, against dictatorship. You know, let's get out the vote. Now, I, you know, Ruth Bader, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, my dear heart and partner in poetry, Sarah Gahill Marin, who is a poet and also a lawyer, took her pen, her legal pen, and went up to the steps of the Supreme Court and she laid it down an offering. And, and so um, I write, wrote this poem, which comes from my book, um, 10,000 Steps Against the Tyrant. I'll read that for you for Labor Day. Here. The Return. The pencil is magic, leaving it an offering on steps of the court. Then the call from the DA's office for a second interview. There is a hand beyond, outside, inside at all times, circulating, sweeping up worshippers who have given the spirit his and her due, who have understood that one knows the world through heart and head, eyes, breath, and with none of these but learned faith, trusting the call out of the blue, ready to rise, pick up the phone and recite the right words, healing words, words that will bring children bawling and smiling into the world, that will give the wrong the chance to escape the unjust, that will break down the trickery of the desperate purveyors of privilege. This is the New Deal again, the throwing out of Coolidge, Miss Smith going to Washington, returning now to Pomenock to assure that Walt Whitman's words will be spoken at this time that Jack Hirschman calls the American Revolution to which I had humbly, and in the eyes of God, the re-revolving, rolling, raising goose hairs and kissing them without the knife, this vegetarian, wine-free, yet wine-respectful, non-American, worldwide, electric, spinning, dial, whirling, mm. whirling from Pomenock to Washington to Frisco Bay, light as a feather, rolling on wind streams into my heart and yours. I, too, am walking now and about to run. Do you mm. see me, light and hope-filled, grateful that the word is in good hands and coming back to the island from where it walked abroad, coming back strong. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for this chance. Always, Thank that's all you do. Thank, Thank you so much, Ingram. And I want to just say in the spirit, I have a Ruth Bader Ginsburg finger puppet that a friend gave me. So I'm pretty, and to remind you all, it's, a, it's a, I don't know, I don't know. It's a li, it seems a little, it's a little strange. I, I, I'm not thrilled that she gave it to me, but here's Ruth today. And I want to remind you, it's a perfect poem to end on. We've been, we've been um, reading poems today um, from, from all over the, from all over the world, folks that have joined us. And a number have been reading from Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace from Lost Horse Press. And if you read the introduction, you'll read um, about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, um, and about her descent in the Lily Ledbetter case, which is what led to President Obama um, then in 2009, uh, signing into law the Lily Ledbetter Act. So if you want to know about that history and the connection to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, oh, it's a fabulous, fabulous introduction to the collection. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to close out today with um, one final poem. I don't, you know me, I don't always often do this, but today I wanted to do it for a couple reasons. And I'm going to put my mom on the spot a little bit. In, um, in my signed copy of Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace, um, I have tucked a picture of my mom when she was at one of her first jobs. She worked in an insurance company in Hartford, Connecticut. And there's my mom sitting at her office. This probably would have been 1963 or so. And in honor of that job and in honor of my mom and in honor of a poet that lived and worked and passed away here in Olympia, a poet, 
a, a poet that many folks in the States know about. Her name is Lucia Perillo. I wanted to read Lucia Perillo's poem that's in the anthology. This is called First Job, 17. Gambelli's waitresses sometimes got down on their knees, searching for coins dropped into the carpet. Hair coiled stiff, lips coated in that henna shade of red, the banner color for lives spent in the wake of husbands dying without pensions, their bodies used in ceaseless marching toward the kitchen's dim mouth, firm legs migrating slowly, ankle word. From that kitchen doorway, Frankie Gambelli would sick a booze eye on them, his arms flapping in an earthbound pantomime of that other Frank, the swooned over. You old cunts, he'd mutter. Why do I put up with you old cunts? Never managing to purge his voice's tenor's note of longing. At me, the summer girl, he'd only stare from between his collapsing red lids, eyes that were empty. Once I got stiffed on a check when a man jerked crazy faced out of his seat, craned around, then bolted from those subterranean women, sweaty and crippled in the knees. Though I chased him up the stairs to the street, the light outside was blinding, and I lost the bastard to that whiteness, and I betrayed myself with tears. But coming back downstairs, my eyes dried on another vision. I saw that the dust trapped by the restaurant's plastic greenery was really some resid residual light of that brilliance happening above us on the street. Then for a moment, the waitresses hung frozen in mid-stride cork trays outstretched like wide-armed reeling dancers the whole some humming and benevolent machine that knew no past, no future, only balanced glasses and the good coin in the pocket. Sinatra was singing Jealous Lover. All of us were young. That's a poem by Lucia Perillo called First Job, 17, reading from Raising Lily Ledbetter, women poets occupied the workspace. Well, everyone, you have occupied much time with us here today on Cultivating Voices, sharing the poetry on the theme uh, and the, the word and the work of labor in all its incarnations. I thank you one and all, and let me remind you who we heard from today. At the top of the hour, it was Billy Brown, Davy Yu on the sax, Julio Magrini, Ken Birch, Mary Louise Kiernan, Josephine Lore, Harvey Sauce, Cathal McThrineford, David Bridges, Charlotte Hart, Shannon Caraza, Jennifer Elise Wang, Laura Ruth Loomis, Don Krieger, Carolyn Wright, Lenora Gates, Susan Young, Max Vandersteen, Isaac Cohen, Linda V. Crawford, Phyllis Klein, Indran Amir the Nyagam, and yours truly reading, Lucia Perillo. Again, I thank you all for being with us here on this day before Labor Day here in the States and uh, in Canada. And, uh, you know, keep, keep, keep writing those poems. The, 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 the labor of love is poetry. We all know that we continue to do it. You all do it so well. And we are all the better for being able to hear your voice here on Cultivated Voices Live Poetry. Well, next week, it'll be our new books showcase. You will want to join us for this amazing quartet of poets that will be, uh, we will be hearing from uh, Katja O'Neill McCullough and Sinead McClure uh, in their, their, their collection, their collaborative collection, and so well as the new books by 
Tave Nice and Michael Sims. So join us next Sunday at the top of the hour, whichever time zone you are in for our Cultivating Voices new book showcase and join us back here in two weeks. Come early if you want to read because it's our wild card open mic two weeks from now on today is the 4th, 11th, it'll be the 18th on September 18th. Well, I've may we I mean, yes, I would like to say we should check in and do a little bit of letting folks chime in and do a unmute and show our appreciation for all our uh, fabulous poets and our audience. Woohoo! Great reading, everybody. Well, again, thank you so much, everyone. And I hope to see you next week for our new book showcase. Uh, I hope you have a great week. I hope you have a good rest of your day or your evening or your your full day into <laughs> evening. And uh, be well. And as I always say at the end of the readings, you know, take take very good care of yourselves. Take very good care of your beloveds. And of course, keep writing your miraculous poetry. This is Sandina for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry with thanks to Kim Ports Parsons and Don Krieger, as always, for their support of the reading. Can't do it without them, and we cannot, of course, do it without all of you. Stay, stay poetry, stay poetry, and we'll see you next time.